CEO of the Alliance for Health Policy, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here today um, to learn more about improving care for children with complex medical needs. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with the Alliance, we are a nonpartisan organization, and we're dedicated to advancing knowledge and understanding of health policy issues. Uh, if you like Twitter, you can uh, join the conversation today uh, using the hashtag WallHealthLive. Um, and uh, if not, that's totally fine too. Um, I want to thank the Children's Hospital Association for, um, for their partnership and support in making this briefing possible. We're really excited. We have a fantastic panel. So um, just quickly by way of background, um, you know, advancements in medicine, as we know, are, are allowing children with medical complexity to live longer. And today there are approximately 3 million children living with medically complex conditions in the United States, and we'll be defining what that means in today's briefing. And many of these children are covered by Medicaid. Um, these children often require intensive services from multiple providers in a range of clinical and non-clinical settings. The volume of care that is required to support these kids poses a unique set of challenges to the healthcare providers, payers, and family members who care for them. During this briefing, panelists will describe factors that impact the quality, affordability, and accessibility of care for children with complex medical needs. So as I said, um, I want to thank the Children's Hospital Association for making today's briefing possible. And I want to invite Mark Witisha, who is the president and CEO of the Children's Hospital Association, to share some opening remarks. Thanks, Mark. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here and uh, having your presence and participation on this important topic. Um, what we'd like to talk a little bit about today are kids with medical complexity, and we've got very expert people on my left to articulate a little bit more about this. Uh, but these are kids, as, as Sarah mentioned, um, of which we think there's a couple million in the Medicaid program, and there's several hundred thousand of them who would be among the most uh, challenge. Uh, we think of kids with medical complexity as having two or three concurrent lifelong chronic health problems. So these are things that aren't necessarily cured, uh, but increasingly are, are things we can treat and manage. Um, what I'd like to do is just to share with you a little uh, story about one of these patients. And I think his picture is you know, run across the screen. So in the summertime, we had um, several dozen families, many of whom had kids with medically complex conditions, come to D.C. and fundamentally make the rounds in Congress. And so one of the families, uh, the Beckwiths from Fort Worth, Texas, I had the privilege to go along with on their, on their visits. Um, their son, Alex, who's a 14-year-old, has a rare form of mitochondrial disease. I won't uh, try to explain all the physiology of that. Suffice to say, he has trouble making energy, just staying alive, and as a result, um, is on an unbelievable medication regimen. Uh, he's got three dozen or so meds that he needs to stay alive. And importantly, he has never eaten. He doesn't eat. He can't eat food. So he is fed through a port. And on top of all this, uh, he appears and and mostly in a wheelchair to save energy and effort, made the rounds in Congress with us, and we uh, had an opportunity to listen to him talk a little bit about his life. I thought I'd share with you the thing that most stuck with me. One of the uh, representatives asked him what it was that he would like to uh, do when he got older. And he looked up and said, uh, you know, maybe meet somebody, get married, have a family. Little things. I think um, I was struck when I get up most mornings. The little things in life I don't think about. I kind of worry about getting over here, finding an Uber, you know, making all my phone calls, and uh, maybe sometimes for some of you too. For some of these kids, there are hundreds of thousands of them. These little things are the magic of what they want to see in their future. It's kind of their dreams. Simple stuff. And that's really what this panel, this meeting this morning is all about. Simple stuff and how we can make some of that possible for some of these kids and give them a shot 
and pieces of life that we all get a chance to experience. So we are thrilled to have you here. Thanks for being here with all of this. I'm going to turn things back over to Sarah. Our panel will get underway with, with great insight and uh, we appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks so much, Mark. Um, for those of you who are just joining us, we do have like, a couple seats up front, so don't be shy. Um, I'm really thrilled that you're here. Um, yeah, we've got one here and one here. If you could raise your hand, if you have a seat next to you. That's it. Sorry. <laughs> All right. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, so let me go ahead and introduce our panel. You're going to hear from four excellent speakers today, um, each of whom brings a different perspective to this discussion, and we're really grateful to have them shed some light on this, this critical topic. Uh, so joining us today, we have uh, Deidre Gifford, who is uh, immediately to my left. She is the Deputy Director of the Center for Medicaid and CHIP Services within the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS. Dr. Gifford has held leadership positions uh, related to the Medicaid programs at the state and federal level and in both the public and private sectors. Notably, uh, she served as Medicaid Director in the Rhode Island Executive Office of Health and Human Services. And prior to joining CMS, she served as the Director of State Policy and Programs at the National Association of Medicaid Directors, NAMID, where she led the organization's efforts with states to support and advance value-based purchasing in Medicaid. Next, we have um, Stephen Groff, who is director of the Delaware Division of Medicaid and Medi Medical Assistance, which is the agency responsible for administering Delaware's Medicaid, CHIP, and state pharmacy assistance programs. Mr. Groff has over 30 years of experience with the Delaware Department of Health and Social Services, focusing on policy and budget and health care and public assistance programs, and he's a graduate of the University of Virginia. We'll hear next from Dr. Karen Fradentoni. She is medical director of the Complex Care Program at Children's National Medical Center and an attending physician and medical educator at the Goldberg's, Goldberg Center for Pediatric Community Health. She's also an assistant professor of pediatrics at the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health. Dr. Fred and Tony provides clinical care to children with complex medical conditions who require multi-specialty care. Her research interest is centered on the transition of complex children and their families from hospital to home. Finally, we'll hear from Rylan Rogers, the Director of Public Policy at the Association of University Centers on Disabilities, the nation's leading voice on disability. Prior, before joining AUCD, Ms. Rogers served as the Training Director and, and Family Leadership Coordinator for the Riley Child Development Center, Indiana's LEND, and was a founding board member of Family Voices Indiana. Both as a parent and as a professional, Ms. Rogers has extensive expertise on topics including special education regulations, public and private health care financing, and family and professional partnerships. So I want to really thank everyone for being here. Um, you do have slides in your packets. You'll be able to see them up here. And I'm also going to invite, um, if the panelists, if you feel more comfortable reading your presentations from the podium so you can look, or we'll advance your slides for you. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Gifford. Perfect. Do you want to organize yourself? participate in this panel on this really important topic and uh, to set a little bit of the federal framework for how <coughs> states and providers can think about uh, improving care for uh, this important population. Um, as Sarah mentioned, uh, of many children with medical complexity are uh, covered by the Medicaid or So uh, so we are um, 
the Medicaid program uh, is up to about uh, 77 million enrollees total, including adults and children. Um, but as you can see here, we are uh, uh, among the largest uh, single employers in the country, sorry, insurers in the country. Um, the Medicaid program alone covers 70 million uh, individuals and 6 million on ship. Uh, we cover nearly half of all the births in the country and uh, over one-third of all children in the United States are covered by Medicaid and 21% of uh, Medicare beneficiaries are also Medicaid members. And this slide uh, just shows you uh, the, uh, the children and families, how important the Medicaid program is in providing coverage. 38% of all children are covered by Medicaid and is obviously highly beneficial. Uh, we cover the vast majority of low-income children in the country, and 49% uh, of births in pregnancy. So, um, so the Medicaid program is certainly a critical component of addressing uh, this issue of children with medical complexity. Um, the, the CHIP program, it, for the most part, the benefits are aligned with the Medicaid program, particularly in those states where uh, the CHIP is a, an expansion of Medicaid. But states do have more flexibility when it comes to CHIP. Uh, if they set up a separate CHIP program, there may be some differences between the Medicaid and CHIP programs in terms of benefits and eligibility. So as we thought about uh, this morning what might be useful for you all in sort of setting the table for this conversation, uh, we thought it might be helpful to briefly walk through what some of the um, most relevant federal authorities are in Medicaid that um, states and providers might think about when uh, talking about models of care for children with medical complexity. Um, as, uh, as I'm sure most of you know, but uh, uh, just to reiterate, um, in the Medicaid program, we are a partnership, uh, both financially and programmatically, between the federal government and states. And unlike Medicare, uh, CMS does not set um, a defined set of benefits for every state, nor do we set a defined set of eligibility criteria. We have a, um, a set of mandatory benefits in populations, but then states uh, go on to build on that set of mandatory benefits in populations and create um, a unique program. So uh, it is not an exaggeration to say that, that we have uh, a unique Medicaid program in every state, the District of Columbia, and the territories. And this is both a, a strength and a challenge. Uh, and I know that, um, that providers of, uh, for children with uh, complex medical needs um, have views on that. <laughs> so um, uh, anyway, so uh, we thought we could talk about what are some of the sort of common authorities that come from, uh, that, that are part of the Medicaid statute and regulation um, that states can build on um, to address challenges. So uh, first of all, the Health Homes, uh, which is in Section 1945. And um, health, home is, uh, health home providers are meant to coordinate all primary, acute, behavioral, and home community-based services to treat the whole person. So this is a benefit that states can elect. Um, and, uh, and you have a reference here if you're interested in finding out more information. We know that uh, children uh, with uh, uh, complex uh, medical needs, one of the primary challenges is robust care coordination. Having an individual and an advocate that can help the family and the child um, navigate. There are many, often many different providers, uh, and be an advocate and uh, a navigator. And uh, health homes are uh, one way that states can choose to provide that benefit. Um, health homes can target either uh, a condition or conditions, or they can target a designated set of providers. These are uh, key features here of the health home that uh, are found in the statute. Coordination and integration, whole person perspective, person-centered planning, a multidisciplinary team approach, um, 
and they can be targeted geographically. Um, importantly, there's a requirement for states that are setting up a health home benefit to consult with the center of the um, administration.
early periodic screening, diagnostic, and treatment. Um, I had the foresight to write down with this. EPSCT is a really important part of the Medicaid program. It's, it's a mandatory benefit for uh, most individuals under 21 in Medicaid. Um, it, it's not an eligibility option for a program. Um, and the states are required to provide comprehensive services and furnish all Medicaid coverable appropriate and medically necessary services needed to correct and ameliorate health conditions based on certain federal guidelines. So uh, although that sound, that may sound to those of you who haven't, uh, who aren't familiar with it as sort of dry regulatory language, uh, it's an incredibly important piece of, um, of the Medicaid framework because uh, it, it basically means that um, for any of these reasons, um, correcting or ameliorating health conditions, uh, Medicaid needs to apply to Um, I, I think I was asked to mention this um, concurrent hospice and curative care benefit for children. This is something that came um, through the ACA. Um, in general, hospice benefits, once an, an individual opts for a hospice benefit and a uh, provider has uh, indicated that the individual likely has six months or less um, to live, uh, then curative uh, services are no longer um, part of, are no longer allowed if the individual's um, in in uh, the ACA, Section 2302, um, the, the, this pro prohibition on curative services for children was removed, and so that children in hospice can be able to carry out the I wanted to mention home and community based services for children, which is covered on the under Covered by Medicaid and CHIP. 
So uh, we think these demonstrations are going to be very important um, uh, in bringing together different provider types, um, looking at the social aspects and in addition to the medical aspects uh, for these children. Um, the funding opportunity announcement has not been released yet, but will be released uh, fairly soon. Um, and we look forward to seeing uh, what new models are coming <coughs> through this award and, uh, and spreading those models in future years. And finally, I just wanted to mention Strong Start, which although it's not a pediatric model, it's a, a, it's a, a pregnancy care model. Um, it's really meant to improve outcomes um, for uh, pregnant Medicaid and CHIP beneficiaries and hopefully uh, to result in fewer preterm deliveries, which can often be a precursor to, um, to medical complexity. So um, we have uh, a, a, a strong start, start model. Uh, final evaluation should be available um, before too long. And there are some interesting findings about sites of care and types of prenatal models that we have led to uh, fewer preterm births. Um, so that's an important uh, new finding coming out of CMS that should be available shortly. So I will stop and uh, allow Steve to talk about the Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Gifford. And um, Steve, I'll invite you if you want to get up to the podium. Um, I could ask maybe just a follow-up question um, for you um, on the health home model. Is that a new option under the state plan amendment, or is that something that's been around for a while? It's an ACA provision. Oh, okay, great, thanks. And just for those who may not know, the difference between state plan and a waiver, is that an easier process to get a health home model? Uh, I think I'm going to but in theory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, what it says, which is there, there are some part of the statute that needs to be waived um, in order to implement the model. Um, we have lots of ways of doing that, and some waivers are less complicated than others. Um, a state plan is sort of the basic tool of describing the Medicaid program, and uh, the approval of a state plan is generally less complicated, and the amount of information, tracking, and monitoring that's required is generally less complicated. Although, as I mentioned earlier, there is some requirement built into the health home that requires some collection uh, of data and reporting to payment. Great, thank you. I do not consider myself by any stretch of the imagination to be a subject matter expert. Um, but I would like to share with you uh, some of the things that we are doing in Delaware right now to try to improve the systems of care for children with medical complexity. Um, So in 2017, um, our budget bill uh, included a directive to the Department of Health and Social Services um, to create a task force to develop a plan to address the needs of children with medical complexity in the state of Delaware. Um, we were given uh, almost an entire nine months in which to accomplish this. Um, so as you can imagine, you know, there was no problem there. Um, but we did go ahead and we formed this group um, and uh, we had uh, meetings uh, that were open to the public and we had incredible support 
from um, our cabinet secretary and the administration. And amazing collaboration from all of the stakeholders. Um, as you heard in my biography, I've been a bureaucrat for 31 years. Um, and I have to say that this was the most collaborative, rewarding um, stakeholder process in which I have ever been engaged. Um, we included our community partners, we included our payers, we included uh, other state government agencies, um, the families, community advocates. And um, while that can often be a challenge, what we found was that once we got past the initial defensiveness, once we got past the tendency to talk at one another and instead talk to one another, um, to actually hear rather than just listen, um, that we began to have a real dialogue. Um, one of the things that I think you'll hear about uh, a little bit later is care mapping. Each of our meetings began with a presentation from a parent in which they shared their care map with us. Um, and I think this is among the most um, educational exercises um, that, that you can go through to actually begin to understand uh, what we are trying to address and what we are trying to achieve in supporting these families. And I really have to um, commend parents have participated in our process for their willingness to do so, their openness, um, and, and the contribution that they brought. Um, our committee didn't get off the ground until 2017, uh, November. Um, we had until May to develop a report. Um, so uh, we uh, basically tried to break down the process. Um, the questions that guided our work were what do we want to achieve? What are the vision and goals that drive our work? What barriers limit um, children with medical complexities' ability to receive appropriate care? And what are some uh, possible solutions? So first off, we realized that we, clear, we needed to clearly define and identify the population because as we began to have discussions, we realized um, what it, uh, children with medical complexity means to one of us is not what it means to another one of us. Um, and so it was very important that we define who exactly we were, were going to uh, address. Um, we developed a pretty broad definition. Um, but it's, it's uh, in a line with uh, what you'll generally see in the literature. We were challenged, or what we were trying to do was balance between being very inclusive, but at the same time realizing that if we don't have a very concrete definition, that is measurable, so to speak, that we're not going to be able to collect the data. We're not going to be able to define the problem. We're not going to be able to evaluate our success or lack of success. Um, and something that's probably important <coughs> to keep in mind when you take this initial step is that you address the defensiveness that might be present even with something that seems as simple as defining the population, because for the family members, this could be perceived as a way to down the road define eligibility for services. And, it, and I found it very important that we get that off the table. This is for understanding um, alone and helping us to address the issues that we identify. Um, it is not a way for us to define eligibility categories or um, service uh, qualifications. Um, we had four, oh, I guess I went too fast, but we'll get there. Um, we had four groups, payers, access, models of care, and data. Um, payers represented the coordination between Medicaid, private insurance, state agencies, and any other payers of care. And something that came out um, 
quite quickly to us was the need for better coordination between primary and secondary payers, especially in the Medicaid program. Quite a few of the families will have access to primary coverage, um, and the coordination that goes along with access to services and payment for services can be quite challenging for those families. Access is the timely use of personal health services to achieve best health outcomes. This can be gaining entry into the system, getting access to sites of care where um, the services are actually provided, and finding providers who meet the needs of individuals um, and who patients uh, can develop a relationship based on mutual communication. <coughs> Models of care broadly defines the way health services are delivered. It outlines best practice care and services. And data is, of course, analysis of the data. So when it came to the payers, I'm going to have to rush. Um, caregivers shared that redundant documentation is one of the most frustrating aspects of coordinating care for children with medical Medical necessity documentation is required for almost all services. Appeals and fair hearings. Caregivers express that the appeal process is very lengthy, often requires that they take time off from work and away from other duties. Uh, and that the fair hearing process can be very intimidating. Um, this came out more than once, that this seemed to be a very adversarial process, almost like a court of law in which the parent felt like they were on trial and defending the very fact that they had requested services that their child needed. I already mentioned coordination between payers. Okay, so, <coughs> am I hitting the button? Access, provider capacity. I don't think this is gonna come as a shock to anybody, um, but uh, it's almost always a challenge. Um, for providing some of the specialized services that are absolutely essential for these children. But also primary care services. Um, and the need for primary care providers to work in consultation with specialty providers um, and actually help families manage um, and navigate uh, the care for their children. Specialists, due to the complex needs of children, with medical complexity, they often require multiple specialty uh, uh, services. Uh, despite the fact that Delaware is an extremely small state, we actually do have three counties. Um, and the two lower <laughs> counties are quite rural. And specialty services, or specialty uh, providers, um, are not readily available, which requires parents to travel to the northern part of the state and or out of state and this can be a challenge. Um, the same goes for out-of-network providers. There are certain types of services that quite frankly just aren't available in a state the size of Delaware because their population doesn't support it. And so parents need to travel uh, out of state and getting those types of authorizations and or transportation support can be a challenge. Um, therapies, getting therapy, speech, occupational, physical, um, because uh, quite, uh, it is most likely that these need to be provided in a community-based setting <coughs> and or the home, and that could be a challenge. Um, imaging and labs. Uh, these are things that we might take for granted, um, but quite often uh, there will be a need for tests or uh, services that are considered rare. Um, and that can be a challenge in getting prior authorization and approval for those services. What came out uh, probably most uh, importantly was uh, nursing and other support services to actually support the families in the home. While we might be able to um, authorize uh, and approve those services, that is far different than actually having access to those services. If uh, the workforce doesn't support it, um, or if you're in an area geographically where it's difficult for the workers to come to your home. Um, and so we heard quite often about missed shifts um, and the need for the family to actually uh, you know, provide the care that we had authorized um, that they be provided. Transportation, um, especially for individuals that uh, cannot ride in 
uh, an old vehicle or are not ambulatory. Um, just as a very simple example, one of the things that we were very quickly able to address was a parent who had, fortunately, um, an accessible van. Of course, we did not support her financially in uh, making that happen, but we uh, further kind of punished her by not providing even mileage support for her to use that van to transport her child to and from appointments. Um, and even though she would be eligible for our non-emergency transportation service, which would take a wheelchair vehicle um, out of service for another member um, and cost more money. And so we pretty quickly rectified that, that we can at least you know, provide some support. And then pharmacy seems to be quite challenging, uh, not only because of special and durable medical equipment, which we know that as well. Um, because of the specialized needs, the fact that what people are requesting quite often don't fit into the standard protocols of what you know our payers might be using when, when making prior authorization decisions. And, um, and some of the unique uh, pharmacy needs that might require compounding. Um, I got a real education on the difference between a solution and suspension um, and uh, how that can impact uh, you know, the ability to um, actually uh, uh, administer a medication. So uh, those are very quickly some of the barriers that we <coughs> have. Uh, models of care, I think that what I would like to say about this is that we are only beginning our work on our models of care. It is um, uh, quite challenging. We do know that what we need to address is um, patient and family-centered care, we need to put the family and the caregivers at the center of this process and the decision-making, and we need to deal better with care coordination. I think something that struck me um, on more than one occasion was we are almost overloading some of these families with care coordinators, and so the family then has to take on the role of being the super care coordinator to coordinate the care coordinators. Um, and there must be um, a better way of, of doing this for people. And then transitioning to the adult system of care. We didn't really get a chance to address this <coughs> yet, um, but it's extremely important. I think uh, we heard a, a little bit about that. We need to take into account what are these children's desires and wants as adults. Um, everybody is going to be slightly different, but um, this is not something that we wait until age 18 to begin to address. Um, we need to help prepare them to be successful in whatever path they choose. Something that we are um, encountering uh, more frequently in Delaware is how do we support some of our medically complex young adults as they go off to college, and they're in a completely different setting. Um, and it has presented challenges, but also great rewards as we see these individuals um, succeed. Um, the data work group, I'm only going to say that the data work group had the most challenges of all because uh, for any of you that are familiar with <laughs> Medicaid data, um, it has um, many, 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 many challenges. So um, we weren't even able to really get basic um, demographics in this short period of time, but we were able to define the parameters that we want to put data on, and we will be doing that as we move forward. So um, let me just finish up with recommendations. I'm sorry if I'm taking more than my own time. Did I get the recommendations? Oh, these are moving slides. Well, good, thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Some of the recommendations. Uh, first and foremost, um, we recognized that we could not do an adequate job um, in the time frame that was allotted. So the very first thing that we all agreed on was that this had to be an ongoing effort. And in fact, we have created a permanent advisory committee for children with medical complexity that had its first meeting yesterday. Um, we are chartering the group, we are developing bylaws, and the first thing that we are going to do is take our initial plan, which quite frankly is more narrative than plan, 
and develop an actual work plan prioritizing what we want to do and, and, and how the, the timeline in which we want to, want to achieve that. Um, recommendation, be clear in contracts about the role of managed care organizations in identifying and providing um, services to children with medical complexity. Um, or did I skip? Oh, I did. Perform a comprehensive data analysis as it relates to children with medical complexity. So as I said, we are going to be analyzing our data. Um, there are some groupers that um, seem to be uh, promising for helping us to actually identify um, these children. And um, that is our next step with, with data. Um, strengthening systems of care with medical complexity. Uh, revise and uh, uh, review and revise as appropriate our policies and processes. We have what we call the Children's Community Alternative Disability Program in Delaware. I'm looking to change that name um, because it's a mouthful. Um, it's basically the equivalent of like a Beckett program. Um, and so we are especially looking at our um, eligibility and redetermination of medical eligibility processes. Um, to try to make it more streamlined uh, for these families and not to insult them by sending them repetitive paperwork um, frequently uh, to uh, document medical necessity. Um, be clear in our contracts about the role of managed care organizations. Um, we're working with our MCOs to develop a mechanism to identify, identify and flag all children with medical complexity. The reason that we want to do that is we want to have separate care coordination um, staff and procedures in place so that families don't get caught up in the original role of prior authorization uh, using standard protocols through three or four levels of prior authorization and care coordination before they get to somebody that actually is familiar with their child's needs um, and can address them. Um, develop and or strengthen existing resources for caregivers, providers in large community. We are looking to develop um, a handbook and or uh, toolbox type materials for parents um, and also to facilitate peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, another thing we're learning is quite often the families get their best information from other families, unfortunately not from our providers um, or our managed care organizations. Um, and strengthen the network of home health providers. Right now, what we uh, want to do is do an initial data collection to see what exactly are gaps in care. Um, because um, I'm one of those people, uh, although we don't seem to do it a lot, I like to define the problem before I work on the solution. Um, quite often in uh, government, we do the reverse. We um, identify a solution and then uh, hope that it's gonna work. So with that, I apologize if I took too much time. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thanks for the really thorough, um, you know, example of what it really takes at the state level. So I'm gonna. We're next gonna hear from Dr. Karen Fred Pony. Go ahead. Thanks. I think you could point it like more at the um, at Catherine over there. Oh, yeah, better. Yeah, there you go. Don't tell me that. <laughs> I just realized that. <laughs> <laughs> Can everyone hear me? Okay, great. All right, so I'm Karen Fratantoni. I'm a pediatrician at Children's National, and I lead our clinical program for children with medical complexity. So in these next few moments, um, minutes, 10, um, <coughs> I, um, I hope to explain a little bit more about children with medical complexity in general. Um, and tell you a little bit about um, my experience as a provider and a pediatrician, and then hope to explain a little bit from my perspective what I think the family's experience is and kind of coordinating care for, um, for their children in the midst of our healthcare system, which has been described so nicely as being quite complex for these families, um, and for providers actually too. Um, so first I want to give you a little bit pers little bit of perspective of kind of what we've been talking about and, and the um, the moderator, as well as um, my previous panelists, have certainly described this really nicely. But I like this visual because it kind of just—it's just out there, right? So we have you know the larger pediatric population, and then within that, we can actually very clearly define children with special health care needs. 
Um, our acronym, um, no child is an acronym, but our acronym, um, because it's a big, long, wordy phrase, um, is CSHCN. And so essentially, that um, those are children who are, have or are at risk for a chronic physical, developmental, behavioral, emotional condition, and require services above and beyond that of a child generally. Um, so that ends up being somewhere from about 13 and a half to about 24 and a half percent of the population. And actually, the um, Child Health <laughs> Survey just released their data. For those of you that are antsy to look at that, it came out a couple of days ago. Um, I've yet to pour over it, but. Um, but they, um, but they, they. I, I think it was Hawaii actually had the lowest, and um, Kentucky had the highest um, at the 24.4 percent, I think. Um, so we're talking about millions of children, about 13.8 million children, um, who are defined as children with special health care needs. So within that, there is this smaller, this smaller group of individuals, very heterogeneous, is the term we use in medicine, meaning not at all alike, right? Of children with medical complexity. Um, so these are kids um, who are just more complex, and I think others have described this pretty nicely. And it's a small proportion of the population. Um, estimates are anywhere from a half a percent to up to five to six percent. They're hard to define, um, but a big portion of the pediatric spend. And these are the children that, that I serve in our, um, in our clinic and try to advocate for um, in our program. So I like this slide. This actually comes from the literature from colleagues of mine um, who really tried to kind of define this. So we had defined CSHCN, but really needed to define what we meant by children with medical complexity. Not that we've got a nice survey to really be able to get our numbers and our data, um, but, but this, is, this is a nice um, visual. So essentially, as it's been described before, these are children who often have high service utilization, so multiple medications frequent hospitalizations, frequent ED visits, multiple specialists, home care services, durable medical equipment, technology. Um, many, many of these kids have tracheostomy, they have ventilators, and they do all of this at home. Um, so that's, that's kind of how we, how we look at this population. And this is a child who happens to have complex medical needs. I use this picture with permission and encouragement, actually. This is one of my patients. Um, and you can see that um, she's, she was here not long ago advocating, um, maybe talking to some of your colleagues. Um, so, so essentially, you know, what do we do to kind of support these families? Um, and families like this, you know, of this patient that I have here, um, we know that these families do a lot better when they're, um, when these kids do a lot better when they're in a medical home, right? When we're able to find, to, we're able to provide accessible care that's coordinated and all those, as I teach my medical students, my residents, all those C words, right? So medical home is coordinated, and it's culturally effective, and it's compassionate. Um, and, and all of those things work a lot better. Um, when, when those things are better for children when they're in medical homes, and things are coordinated well for them. So there are barriers. Um, some of those have been discussed, and I think Rylan will talk a little bit more of those from a parent's perspective. Um, but there, there are barriers. So these kids are frequently hospitalized, as I said, and they have ED visits. Parents struggle to manage the care of their children while also just leading their lives, right? Making a living, going to work, caring for their family members. Um, and then also trying to make it to all their specialty visits, care for their child when they're hospitalized, and make it to the PCP office. And providers struggle too. Um, so we struggle to provide coordinated care. Um, and there's a lot of work that has to happen very realistically outside of that clinical visit, which is kind of our reimbursable unit. Um, and so to be a good provider, and we all have pretty high standards for ourselves, um, you really have to coordinate with those other providers and all the other care team members outside of that clinical visit. And unfortunately, our reimbursement structures don't always support that, nor do our electronic medical records um, and other ways that we try to communicate. So a lot of that stuff happens outside of, um, outside of kind of normal, normal patterns. Um, but kids benefit and providers benefit when we're able to do this. I'm going to let you guys just kind of look at that as I tell you a little bit more about kind of what we do in complex care. So um, this is a care map. I think Stephen kind of referred to this, that he starts out, um, started out each of his meetings, which is really admirable with the family, um, being able to draw out their, um, their care map. So I'll let you guys look at that as I talk for a moment. Um, so the complex care program, just a little bit about kind of 
what I do at Children's National and what we try to do kind of within complex care, our complex care program and complex care programs across the country. Um, so as I, as I mentioned, it's hard for many, many providers to kind of provide the kind of care that we've talked about the kids need. And so over the years, the past 10 or 15 years, we've seen the, um, the emergence of complex care programs, often at academic institutions, to provide that coordinated care. Um, and so ours lives within the Goldberg Center for Community and Pediatric Health, which is at Children's National. Um, in our larger pediatric center, we have about 40,000 patients that we see. About 82 or 83% of those um, are DC residents, and about half of those live in Ward 7 and 8 in our primary care centers. Um, and then within the complex care program, when we talked about kind of percentages, it kind of works out. We have about 900 kids that we see in complex care, um, spread among um, a little bit over a 1.0 full-time equivalent provider and other providers as well, and a larger care team. Um, and so we, most of the kids, as we've kind of defined children with medical complexity, and we struggle, right, because we lack an, an actual tool to do this, our kids that, that, as Mark referred to earlier, are those that subset of really, really complex kids. So oftentimes these kids are technology dependent um, and require lots of other services. Um, so I'll move on to the, the care map that you see here. So this is a care map of one of my, um, one of my parents, of one of my patients, um, actually created. We encourage our families to draw these care maps. It's a very validating experience. It's also a very, um, it's really wonderful as a provider to see this pictorial, real representation of what they go through. And as, um, as she was completing it, I asked her, I said, so, so how do you feel? And she picked up a piece of paper and she said, this one piece of paper, really heavy. And it was emotional for me, right, to, to hear her talk about it. She goes, and it just, and I realized why I'm so tired. And then she pointed down to where she drew that her child has a sleep disorder. And she goes, and I realized why none of us sleep. <laughs> and, and they have some troubles with that. Um, but she also said, you know, it's worth it. All of this hard work is worth it because my child is worth it. And I said to her, I said, I, I agree. I'm going, to tell you, I'm going to shift gears a tiny bit and tell you a little bit about our, our experience um, with uh, the CARE Award, um, which was a, um, a wonderful project that we were so happy to be involved in. Um, so the Children's Hospital Association received a Healthcare Innovation Award from the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Innovation. Um, this happened in about 2014, and then they started enrolling patients in 2015. It was a collaboration um, between 10 hospitals and CHA, where they actually rolled out um, some really novel and I think just elegant change concepts um, that could really improve the care that we provide for families and patients. Simple things, like they, they were almost so simple, they were beautiful, like care plans. Of course we should all be creating care plans. Access plans, making sure our families know when they need to go to the emergency room or when they would need to seek care and under what conditions and when their status changes, what should they do, um, but really writing it out and helping <coughs> parents um, you know, be, be aware of that and other team members as well. Um, and so this was, it was eight, eight state Medicaid agencies, as I've said here, about 8,000 patients were enrolled. Um, and the, the entire goal, essentially, was to improve care and also see that if we could kind of reduce caregiver burden while also reducing costs. And so this just kind of describes the 10 hospitals, and Children's National was one of those um, hospitals. So before I kind of go directly into the last slide that actually shows the results, and I see that I'm running out of time, too. It's very easy to go over when you're passionate about something. Um, and it's important, exactly. Um, it was actually a really amazing experience for our, um, for our hospital to be part of this award. We were very privileged um, and happy to be involved. Um, we were able to really identify this patient population a little bit better, harness the resources that we needed, um, have institutional recognition that this was a really um, needed intervention and a very worthy um, population. Um, and, then, and then we learned a few other things kind of along the way. And one specifically was just the importance of kind of family engagement and really putting the family at the center. Um, we have a parent navigator program, which is a peer-to-peer -peer mentorship program that's been in existence at Children's since 2009. Um, and we were able to involve our parent navigators um, who are paid employees at the hospital 
who, as a side note, actually are parents themselves and children with, many of them have very complex medical needs, some have special health care needs, and they really, they really are amazing in that they can kind of sometimes get at barriers and needs um, from other parents that honestly we as providers would never, um, never be able to obtain. And so they have, they've, they've, been, they've been really intimately involved or were intimately involved in kind of rolling out all of our change concepts and it was much, much more effective in some respects than having an external advisory board because they were embedded within our health system, within our electronic medical record. And so they were kind of our balance and check the entire time of our, what we, you know, is, is what we're trying to accomplish actually right for families. Um, and then the second thing in, around keeping kind of the family at the center is one of the things that emerged um, out of the you know, better coordinated care was the need, the identified need for families to be able to have visits by physically not actually being at the hospital. So we were able to roll out um, direct medical care telemedicine visits, and we've been piloting that for quite some time now, um, especially around hospital discharge and um, care coordination visits. So if you have a medically complex child that's been admitted to the hospital for weeks on end, and then the hospital discharge summary, because providers are kind of clueless, says, let's follow up with your PMD in two days. Well, really what I want to see, unless I'm rechecking a weight or I'm concerned about a respiratory status, is I want to see them in their home environment, and I want to see how they're doing, right? And I want to look around at their equipment. So we've been able to roll out through a HIPAA-compliant platform um, tel direct to consumer telemedicine, which has been um, amazing. Uh, the first time that I, that I actually did, I, I think I did the first complex care telemedicine visit at Children's, and the mother screamed for a minute straight. She was so excited. She's like, Dr. Pratt, don't eat. Okay, close my door. <laughs> she was really excited. And then we were able to, to, you know, I was able to look at some of her equipment and some other things that had been issues. Um, but it was around, like what had been said before, is really putting the family kind of at the center of what we do. And now for the, um, for the good results from the care award, we have others in the room that certainly can speak to this um, as well is um, we were actually able to move the dial um, on this, and this was a really large study. I said the 10 hospitals and over 8,000 kids, but, um, but we're able to reduce ED discharges um, and, and really improve, um, you know, improve the family experience a little bit as well in the process um, and decrease the spend. Um, so this, this makes me, this and this entire panel make me hopeful for the future of our kids of medical. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Rylan Rogers. Thanks, Rylan. While well, we're getting the slides pulled up, um, let me, uh, oh, here we go. I won't ask my question. Mm -hmm. So I'm delighted to be here this morning. This whole conversation really reflects um, my life and the really the opportunities that exist from this conversation. My frame has always been that families who are raising children with disabilities and complex health care needs are really the canaries in the coal mine of our American system. And the lessons that we can teach the system and what we can move change forward is the transformation and the opportunity that we can all benefit from. You've heard today about access to coverage and access to adequate insurance. I think the piece that really stuck for me to the conversation is how that varies so significantly from state to state. One of the most common questions I get as a family leader is where should I move to? And that's a real reflection of challenging experiences in America. I think about that in terms of pediatric health care, but we're also seeing similar questions in the adult health care system. So there's some lessons for us to think about that in transforming it. We talked a little bit about cost and some of the real life issues for this population in terms of the cost that they're experiencing. I know families that are raising kids who know more about the pharmaceutical debate than the pharmaceutical companies. Um, and there's some value in that and really thinking about the complexity of getting the right medication when the medication is a life or death issue for the person you love most. So really thinking that through. And cost isn't just about health care. It's about access to community. For some of the needs around durable medical equipment, 
may seem like a hospital specific question, but really it's a life question. So thinking those three things through is critical and important. I loved this conversation because the other piece about this population that's so relevant in America is there's agreement. Families and providers both see the struggle and we understand it from each other and we're at a place to try to raise that struggle to a change and for movement. And really, what a lesson for America. We can see across the different silos and really be at a place to think about how to move that struggle forward. So a little bit about what brings me here. Um, this is me. Uh, 21 years ago, at the moment that I knew that my life would be totally about healthcare policy. This is my son, Matthew. I had, he's now 21, and his sister, Laura, is 18, and they both have mitochondrial myopathy. In this picture, we didn't know that because we were a little bit ahead of the science in our family in terms of getting diagnostic clarity. But we knew that what was going to happen to our family and what her lives were changed forever was confusing, transformative, and overwhelming. But this is me, and this is me now, but it's really a reflection of millions of American families. So I always like to take a step back and think about there are other families in this room that have this picture in their heart and their lives, and there are families right now having this picture somewhere in America. And those are the families that this discussion is most pertinent to. Um, one of the things to know about our family's life is that it was touched by many things. We were uninsured and uninsurable until the passage of the ACA. We had um, a system and an experience with long Medicaid wait lists. We benefited significantly from Title V programs doing some gap filling. So really thinking about all the different parts of the systems that touch families. We thankfully got to the lovely place of being engaged in both private insurance and Medicaid waivers to support to ensure adequate health insurance and coverage. Um, and then really understanding the challenges of getting those systems to work together. I love the comment about the multiple prior authorization paperwork. I have a lot to say about the hours of my life that I have spent in prior authorization before. And now my children are um, on their own, not really, but have <coughs> self-managed their prior authorization paperwork. It's given me back at least 10 hours in my week. They're taking it on, so it's great outsourcing. <laughs> <laughs> the one piece that I do want to take a step back is this conversation about defining a population and using the term children with medical complexities. There's lots of value to defining populations and helping us to understand. There's also some challenge and risk to that that I'm concerned about. I always like to take the big step back and realize that the only label that matters to children and families is child's name. And that's a piece that we often forget. The other reality is that we often are labeling children in different silos, but not empowering families and children themselves to understand that being a child with medical complexity also often correlates to being an individual with a disability. And we often think about sometimes based on status and healthcare outcomes that you can slide across different spectrums. And when we can get into some really challenging unintended consequences when we define populations. The one that weighs heavily on my heart right now is families who are resisting the opportunity that's medically available to remove some of the technology from their children's lives because it would lead to reduced access to service. So if we're creating a system where a family maintains a ventilator or a G2, because that's how you get care, and we've got some work to do in terms of systems and services. Um, I also really believe strongly that when we think about children's populations, we have to start thinking about what will the definition or the label be in adulthood, and start to help people embrace that from the very beginning. We talk a lot about the transition cliff, and one of the pieces we can do is help get people connected to adult identity from the very beginning. I really truly believe that this is about a trickle up. 
Too often in America, we look at healthcare from the adult side and push down. There's so many lessons and opportunities from pediatrics that we can take a look. We've heard about Steve's great example about how collaboration with families and end users drives systems in Delaware. Think about what that can mean to lots of different um, models. We think about our lived experience of really navigating having private insurance and public insurance and trying to make that work. This is something that is going to be more and more critical in adult populations. So we have lessons to learn there. We think about the tr reality that families are living quality of life issues far outside of the hospital, that life and um, systems and services are about school and access to community, and that's true across the life course. So I like to think about that. The one nugget that I love most from my work in pediatrics and my work in Title V is the acknowledgement of the importance of the family voice, of individuals with medical complexity, of the youth voice, and the movement to make those voices a paid part of what's driving the system. And that's a lesson that we can take to all parts of our system. I also love this slide because it's terrible. <laughs> it really is a picture of how our federal policies interact around disability, and it explains in one picture why the care map is such a challenge, why understanding the prior authorization is such a challenge, why everything <coughs> is siloed and not working. It's my life's work to someday have a much better picture. I think I have a lot of job security in that. <laughs> but I do think that there's some lessons that for us all to keep that picture in mind. I love the comment about multiple care coordination. I will share a truth of the matter, which is the fact that I blocked the voicemail um, on my phone for the 10 care coordinators that were assigned to my family because I did not have the time to coordinate the care coordinators. I couldn't care for my children and work, and as it turns out, do the things they weren't going to be able to deliver anyways and talk to them. So I blocked them on my um, we went and interestingly, while I was the primary investigator on a care coordination research project. <laughs> it's a log roll. Um, because my children are 18 and 21 now, we are off the cliff. And transition is a real issue. I remember when I started this work at their birth that I was delighted to see all of the energy and focus around transition. And I naively believed that it would be solved by the time I needed it. Boy, was I super duper wrong. So I think that the reality of the challenges of this are the next step and the important step. Because the outcome, what we get as a society, is doing this well. My children are amazing people, and they have lots to contribute to society. But making sure that they're able to be in college you know, in order for my daughter to accept a college scholarship, she had to lose Medicaid across state lines. What does that mean? Where are these barriers? That clip of after EPSDT, how do you make sure that your coverage is adequate? These things are real, and this is our work to make sure that we can launch people to contribute to our society. My final um, picture is where I live, sort of, sort of here and sort of over there. Um, but this is our home in Indiana. And I always want to remember that this conversation looks very different based on where you live in America. In Indiana, we live an hour and a half north of Indianapolis on 200 acres of my husband's grandparents' farm, very beautiful. But there was no access to home health care. The entire time we had Medicaid waivers, they were never serviced in our home. I did all of the medical services. This is the reality of rural America. There's real challenges. There's challenges of crossing state lines, and we need to talk about those families in a meaningful way in all parts of our conversation. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. Um, so we have about 20 minutes for um, audience Q&A, um, and you can, uh, if you have a question, I. Uh, you should have a green card, you can stand up at the mic, or since it's a little crowded, even if you raise your hand, I'll, I'll try to call on you. Um, just um, 
while um, folks are getting organized, I just, I just want to comment, it's interesting. One word I did not hear at all in describing this population is the word vulnerable, and we sometimes kind of talk about vulnerable populations, and I just really want to comment on the extraordinary strength that I, I think really just shows through for the patients, um, the, the children themselves, the families, the providers, and, and for everyone who's, who's working to, to address these issues. I think it's, it's extraordinary, and um, so I'm, I'm glad we didn't hear that word. Um, and I want to commend you. Um, does anybody have a question for our panel? Because if not, I'll just I'll dive into some of my questions. Um, <laughs> so, Dr. Frantoni, I was curious because you mentioned kind of the the direct medical care um, and telemedicine visits that you started, and I was actually struck by some of the parallels between um, children with medical complexity and sort of adults with medical complexity, and some of the programs. Um, that are currently in place, such as um, independence at home, to actually create like home care visits for adults. And I was just kind of curious if there's um, for you or for anyone on the panel, if there's any thought to you know demonstrations or programs that would um, kind of provide direct care in the home. So, can let you guys speak to is this on? Can you hear me? speak to demonstration projects, but I can speak very directly to kind of the, the direct-to-consumer telemed is, is a different thing than having, you know, a group of providers at a hospital center that are the experts, and then you have another provider in the community that has someone in their office, um, and then you're, you know, you're using the cardiologist at the health center to kind of, this is actually just me and the patient, and then sometimes I can actually involve um, our care coordinators, our case managers, and sometimes a parent navigator. We have, um, I've done telemedicine visits where I have involved teachers. Um, so we can actually get at some behavioral health stuff and have a teacher and the parent um, and even a specialist kind of involved. Um, reimbursement's still an issue. Um, so we've done some um, work with our DC Medicaid programs to get some reimbursement. We have some grant funding through the hospital system um, to actually implement this. But that is that that is one big challenge um, is just reimbursement. Um, we see kids in Maryland, Virginia, and DC, and then elsewhere as well. But those are our primary. Um, so the reimbursement is slightly different in each of those um, areas around direct to consumer um, telehealth. Um, those are, the, and the other, the other thing, and re realistically too, is just, the, and this is gonna sound simple, but the scheduling, like just the, just the actual, like, how do you tell families about this? And we struggled with this. We actually had an intern work with us all summer to try to enroll families in telemedicine. Um, so you schedule them, you get them to download the app, then you call them in advance, and all that realistically takes a lot of time. So um, it's embarrassing to admit that I schedule most of my own telemedicine visits and then I call parents to remind them. Um, that's probably not a great use of my time. Um, I don't know that I'm great at it, um, but so, so some of those, just, just those kind of realistic, um, realistic things. Thanks. So I'll just I'll mention that um, telemedicine in general is a coverable service uh, in Medicaid, um, and, and states don't need uh, special any kind of special waiver to cover telemedicine but um, uh, as Karen mentions uh, you're, you will see variation from state to state uh, in what they choose to cover and how much they choose to pay the other thing that I meant to say during my comments um, that's important to this conversation and um, and sort of underlied everyone's conversation but we, we didn't say out loud is that most children in Medicaid and CHIP are covered through Medicaid Medicaid managed care. There are only a, a few states um, where the primary relationship is between the state and the provider. So um, mostly, most of the time, for these children, there'll be an intermediary, which is supplying some of the care coordinators uh, at the health plan level. But um, but that's uh, relevant to the conversation about telemedicine because those policies uh, will vary from plan to plan as well. So we had a question. Um, so one of the green cards, which um, I think, Rylan, this was a point you were making. Um, can you elaborate on the point about families who have incentives to um, keep the DME and the G-tubes, et cetera, to maintain their eligibility? Can you share a little more about that? Yeah, and it sounds like a couple of us. Um, some of the challenges are in terms of how a family accesses Medicaid. So if you're on a home and community-based waiver system, you need to meet a level 
appear to be eligible. Um, so in my home state of Indiana, there is a aged and disabled Medicaid waiver that serves medically complex children. And it requires an eligibility to have you know, some, basically, some sort of outside equipment. Um, so a G2 qualifies. And if your child becomes stable enough to no longer need the G tube, then you would lose Medicaid through the waiver service and the other supports that might be actually making your child stable and able enough to move beyond the G tube. Um, and that is, you know, a concrete example related to coverage. But there's also a, the part that's discomforting to me is there's a growing sort of access point. You have coverage, but you get this enhanced or what I like to call real care coordination if you meet this level of complexity and then great things happen. You have a fabulous primary medical home, your team's working well together and that helps you and your family function well and maybe your health improves and then if your child's not meeting the your level of complexity to do that, those that real care coordination can fall away and that loop can start again. So there's lots of challenges in thinking it through. Obviously, there's limits to these resources. High quality, effective care coordination is time intensive, but thinking about what the investment of that time does in terms of healthcare cost is some of the great work that came out of the coins and other efforts to really evaluate this. Um, Stephen or Steve uh, Ray, do you have any comments as far as like from the state or federal perspective, kind of why some of these kinds of eligibility rules might be in place and, and what might be done to kind of address it or maybe you've done something about it in Delaware? I'm challenged. <laughs> it's on? It's on. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, so that was something that I had not heard. Um, and it might be because of the fact that we don't serve our children in Delaware through a waiver. Um, we actually do have the program that I talked about, which probably has um, a somewhat uh, less rigid um, medical eligibility <coughs> component than the, the waivers uh, that, that you've experienced. So, um, but it, does ring true because I have heard similar kinds of um, frustration among individuals who meet a level of care need for eligibility due to a chronic condition and get the care they need in order to improve their health status um, and then lose their eligibility and no longer receive the care that they get and uh, that they need in order to maintain that level of that <coughs> higher uh, health status, and then just cycle. Because, um, and in those cases, the, the argument that I get is why don't we have some dispute <coughs> eligibility around certain disease specific states, um, with, which we don't. Um, <coughs> but um, it is. An interesting dilemma. I understand how it can happen, and it's something I'm going to look at just to make sure that we're not experiencing that in Delaware. So I'll give a generic response if I don't know the particulars of the, either the program or the, the child. For some home and community based services <coughs> waivers in Medicaid, just at a very high level, writ large, uh, an individual needs to meet what we call an institutional level of care. Uh, meaning in order to qualify for the waiver, you, you need to, uh, to demonstrate that the services being provided are to prevent the individual from being institutionalized. Um, whether that requirement, uh, my, my guess, but I'm not the subject matter, matter expert here, my, um, my hunch is that that is statutory with respect to some of those sections, like 1915. And, um, and so, uh, as a result, the state is obligated to operationalize. What does that mean to be uh, you know, institutional, uh, institutional eligible? And so that is probably why it turns into things like, well, if you have a tube, or uh, obviously if you're, if you're a family or something, 
but some of these other more complicated um, situations might have been sort of operationalized as that's how we define otherwise eligible for institutional care. And, um, and I just want to clarify that, it, that a, a family that was otherwise Medicaid eligible by basis of income wouldn't lose their, their Medicaid benefit, but for, for somebody who becomes eligible through the waiver because of this, um, a combination of income and uh, medical necessity um, could potentially lose some of those services. Thank you. Okay, we have a question at the mic, and then I have one on the card. Uh, my name is Nick Fiore from the Duke Margola Center for Health Policy. I want to first thank you all for your presentations and for being here today. Um, maybe a sort of forward-looking question. Um, so, you know, we, I've heard many of you talk about the role of uh, technology, medical products, and pharmaceuticals in this space. Um, as those sorts of products continue to move forwards to have potentially curative or treatments through gene therapies that can restore significant functional status for things like Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, inherited retinal blindness. Um, what do you see as some of the near-term opportunities either through CMMI pilots to make sure that those sorts of treatments are being targeted effectively in the very complex care management landscape? And what do you see as maybe also some long-term opportunities either through new regulation or CMMI pilots or legislation to enable access um, to make sure that reimbursement for those products are actually tied to patients getting them and them working over a long period of time. I don't want to tackle that one first. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we have some lessons of history to guide us. Um, the one that just popped into my head is the movement around cochlear implants and how that's transformed the disability experience for children with significant hearing loss. And I know one of the beauties, I was thrilled to hear you say EPSDT because I'm almost gonna get a tattoo, I love EPSDT so much. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really do. Um, but under EPSDT, we were able to ensure that a generation of children benefited from that intervention and the follow-along care, because it, as you're alluding to, it's you know, ongoing to the technology of mapping, and as technology has changed in this generation, it's been multiple levels. Where we've seen a challenge that we need to be thoughtful about is when those same children have become adults, their access to maintain that coverage. So I often hear from young adults who are now in college, and they need their mapping updated for their cochlear implants and they hit a wall in terms of insurance access into that. So I think there's some lessons there. There's also great work happening and from sort of the advocacy world of families seeing these opportunities, working aggressively with their state partners, with the federal partners at Medicaid to say, we need to make sure that this is gonna be covered and that we can benefit from this moving forward. But it is a, a frontier that requires a lot of attention and thought. Thank you. Okay, we are, um, it's amazing, we're kind of getting close to our time, but I just wanna ask a, um, a question that was on the card. So there's several pieces of legislation currently um, being considered um, to address um, children with medical complexity and their needs, and there was a question for the panel um, as to whether you could comment on the ACE Kids Act, which um, deals with enhanced pediatric health homes for children with complex medical conditions. And if anyone wants to comment on that or give an explanation, um, please feel free. And with the caveat that obviously the Alliance is not here to lobby or weigh in, we just want to um, kind of get, get the panel's thoughts. <laughs> Um, so we are um, obviously looking at the AIDS Kids Act. Um, DJ also talked about the AIDS model. Um, you know, I think that as my uh, new advisory committee uh, moves forward with this work, clearly we're going to get recommendations around what models of care should look like. And I would imagine that it will involve um, 
some version of a health home or health home like um, uh, model. So we're interested in exploring. Um, at this point, uh, it would be premature to say what road we'll go down. Um, that needs to be a broader discussion with our stakeholders and our consumers. Um, and uh, probably with CMA. Um, but we are hopeful that there are now some opportunities out there that we can uh, possibly capitalize on um, to help us expedite our, our progress and maybe even uh, leverage some additional funds. Um, I'm Young stakeholder, which is um, <laughs> <laughs> the whole time I'm like totally amazed. Um, all right, we have a question at the mic. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I appreciate your pulling this program together. It's been a great presentation. I'm uh, with the Marshfield Clinic in Wisconsin, and my question goes to the issue of who owns this problem. Um, and just to describe briefly, uh, we take care of about a million people in Wisconsin, but we have 200 kids that fall into this particular category. And what we've found is with care coordination nurses that are purely assigned to individual families, we can save about 20% on their hospitalization costs. And that reduces the overall cost considerably. What happens, these kids though, they come in as commercial patients initially, spin down basically, bankrupting their parents, wind up on Medicaid, ultimately Medicare, disability population, duals. The question is, is we can show that there's enormous savings if someone spends the little bit of money that it takes to pay for those care coordination nurses. And but we have a, we're having a very difficult time. For the most part, we've relied on philanthropy to pay the salaries of those nurses. But so, you know, I, I'm, I think you, you all have done a wonderful job describing the problem, but I, I don't see who yet is accepting the responsibility. If you can help us understand that, we'd certainly appreciate it.
so we're coming to the end of our time. Um, I do just want to take a minute and just ask everyone on the panel, just take a very uh, brief time to just describe if there's kind of one takeaway that you hope that, um, that our audience today I mean, takes like home with them. Uh, could you could you share that? Um, and then I'll ask our audience um, before you leave if you could kindly fill out the blue evaluation form in your folders. We would really appreciate that. We do take all of your comments into consideration as we're planning future events. So key takeaways for our audience. You want to go first, Ryland? Um, for me, I think it is that there are opportunities and examples of efforts underway to make things better. And a key part of making sure that it's effective and real sustained change is making sure that children and families are at the center and are driving these systems to move forward. You said it so much, so much more articulately than I could have, and I was going to say almost the same thing about keeping the family and the patient kind of at the center of what we do, because this is for them. So, um, not to be uh, redundant, um, so I won't. Uh, to go back to that gentleman's last question, I think um, perhaps a key takeaway is that we all are on this problem, and we all have to uh, acknowledge that and take um, our share of the responsibility and work together because it's too complex um, to uh, address in a comprehensive way unless we all put it. I think um, the, I'll go with the glass half full um, takeaway, which is uh, there are um, many challenges remaining, but many bright spots uh, in, the, in the care delivery system, many dedicated advocates and providers and bureaucrats who are, uh, are, who are working on this uh, challenge. So I think that, that um, there's a lot to build on. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you so much to all of you. You do such important work and, and taking time uh, with your busy schedules to come and educate all of us. Um, we really appreciate it. Thanks again to the Children's Hospital Association for making this possible and to all of you for spending the morning with us. Thank you to our panelists.